All right, well, it's 12 o'clock and it's time to get started. Hello, everyone. I'm Sarah Hanewald from One Schoolhouse, Assistant Head of School for Professional Development. And I'm excited to have with me here today one of our teachers and someone who is doing extraordinary work at her school, Leslie Fry. And then I also have my colleague, Liz Cates, here to join us and um, as we explore this question of wellness for campus adults. I just want to remind everyone, uh, we are being recorded. We'll have time for Q&A at the end. If you've got questions, please put them in the Q&A. And of course, use the chat to connect with one another. So as we begin, and we've still got some folks joining us, I'll just do a quick reminder of what's going on at One Schoolhouse. And Liz has some exciting news here too. So on our blog, right now we have one authored by Liz that is focused on wellness, the road we all need to travel. And I know that you'll enjoy reading that. Next week, we're gonna talk about teaching languages online. And that is something that we get a lot of questions about. How does one teach a language online? So we're gonna share some insights and strategies there. Um, Liz, do you wanna talk a little bit about a new offering that we have? Sure. So in our conversations with schools, one of the things um, that we kept hearing was that schools had a small number of students um, who weren't going to be able to return to campus. Maybe they were immunocompromised themselves or they had a family member who couldn't um, take who couldn't take the vaccine. Um, and so we had those schools reaching out saying, we don't want to put our teachers through concurrent instruction again. What can we do? So in response, we have expanded our course catalog to include more courses that are typically required for graduation. What that means is that um, students can sign up next year for an English course, a math course, history course, um, and um, for our core, for our consortium schools, um, we students can in this uh, who are following this kind of enrollment strategy with their school, uh, consortium schools can sign students up for a single semester of a full year course if uh, it meets the conditions that that we're lying out here. Um, so we hope that this will be helpful. We've had a lot of interest in it. We're talking to schools. Um, please reach out to me or to our office if you have any questions. Great, and I'll drop Liz's email in the chat as well if folks are Thank interested you. in this opportunity. So just a reminder, on our independent curriculum website, we have our standards and principles for independent curriculum, and we've got professional learning, um, as well as some updates on that site, information for colleges, for uh, those who are wondering, well, how do we communicate with colleges about what we're doing if we're not doing what we've traditionally done with advanced courses? And then coming up this summer, we have Restore, Reflect, Restore, and Renew. And Leslie and I have been talking about that course, and we've been talking about this webinar for a while too. So we're excited, and we are going to get to it. Of course, we have Building Trust as well, which is an important course that has um, really generated a lot of good conversation as well. So I'm going to stop sharing. And we're back. And Leslie, thank you so much for joining us today. I really do feel like we've been talking about this <laughs> for a long time. And you teach a course for us that is um, really interesting to students and um, in abnormal psychology. And then at Springside Chestnut Hill Academy, you're the school psychologist. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came into your both roles, really? Yeah, sure. Well, um, so I came into my position as a school psychologist about, uh, I guess it was like 12 years now. I mean, my, it, and it's funny when you think about it because my mom was always in education and my dad was in therapy and the people pleaser that I am, I chose to do both. So, um, and at the time people kept saying, oh, it's so easy. It's so easy. You just listen to kids all day. And in reality, that is not has, and has never been the case. Um, and that wouldn't be easy either. And it wouldn't be easy. <laughs> and it definitely in these times is not the easiest. Um, so I have been at Springside Chestnut Hill Academy for five years now. I was previously in public school where I evaluated students for special education services. And now in um, this setting at Springside Chestnut Hill Academy, it's been more of helping them with accommodations, um, helping them with student support, being a liaison, and as well as counseling and, and being like the dump <laughs> or the person that people go to when they want to vent, um, as well as help 
teachers, students, and parents um, connect to figure out the best way to support the students. Great, well, really interesting work and not, um, in listening is important and not easy and a big part of it. Yeah. So how has this year gone at your school? So I would say that the, the word of the year is definitely adjustment um, and being flexible um, because we started thinking that, you know, we are a big school, we have all these acres, we can do anything, let's all be in person. And what we found is that's not always the case. And obviously with the cases rising for COVID um, and just CDC guidelines, um, things shifted on and off. So one day we might all be in person and the next day we'd be virtual or half of us would be virtual. Um, and then we have students who are international and have been all year. So we've had a hybrid kind of setting, um, but we've definitely had to be creative at all times. And right now we're all in person, which is great. Um, it, with the exception of a few students like the international students and students who can't be in for high risk. Um, but for the most part, you know, it's, it's been a ride <laughs> to say the yeah. least. So a word that comes to mind is erratic. Yes. So yes. Um, it's interesting because even personally for me, I was out, um, until I got vaccinated. And so when I came back, there was just like this frenetic feeling around, um, because you just don't know, you know, you, you don't know if everybody's going to be in the next day. You don't know who, what teachers or students not, might be in. Um, and so there is this amount of shifting um, and, and switching and having multiple different ideas and things going around just because you just, you're not aware. Um, and that's, you know, I, I was looking at this New York Times article that you had sent me, Sarah, and it was interesting because everybody's talking about how you know teachers are used to being these machines and being you know doing things a certain way, but this is not this year, um, and so that uncertainty causes stress. And so with that, um, you have to be as a teacher somebody who maintain or feel like you need to maintain the same feelings and express the same way to your students because you want to present yourself a certain way, but that's not reality. Um, and and students know that because they're dealing with it too. Um, and to increase level than their usual, especially in an upper school where the next step is all about high school. I mean, it's all about college, excuse me, um, and making sure you have what you need to prepare for the next steps for your future. Yeah, and so thinking about transitions and how students normally pro process transitions, and we have kids who transition quickly and kids who really need to process a transition and and they need a lot of heads up, you know, this is gonna happen and here's something you're going to need to think about. And we couldn't give them that this year, could we? No, not in the least. Um, and I think it became more teachers being having to be honest with their students as well as with themselves on um, this is, I can't give it to you the way that I'm used to. And also how do I do it for myself, right? Um, because I, I can't figure it out. <laughs> and I have to switch it up at the, the drop of a hat um, just based on the day and, and what's happening. Yeah. And Liz likes to talk about, you know, friction and how we do everything that we can to remove friction when it's unnecessary. Obviously, mm -hmm. there are times where we want kids to, you know, wrestle with a big question or an issue. Um, so Liz, would you say that this year has had a lot more friction? Oh, I, I think like it's just been one skid patch after another. Um, <laughs> absolutely. And I think when we talk about friction, it's really important to make the distinction, as you did, Sarah, between productive um, friction and um, which is designed to, you know, we have to sort of grapple with it and then ways in which friction um, gets in the way of what we're trying to do. Um, so I used to be, um, I started out my career in boarding schools and um, my, uh, one of the rules that I instituted in my dorm was when I come into your room for lights out, you need to be in your pajamas and you need to be in your bed. Um, and that was because we knew they were all getting out of bed. Absolutely. But if they were in bed, even for just a minute and in their pajamas, they might realize bed was a nice place to be and it made it harder to get out. So that was to me sort of a case of where we tried to reduce friction to help make positive decision-making. 
I love that analogy. I think that's a great one. I think a, a lot of parents can relate to that too. Um, so Leslie, you had a really interesting leadership assignment this year. You were charged with helping the faculty and staff through all of the friction and challenges of this year. And can you tell us all a little bit about the why behind the role that you took on and what exactly your um, approach was? Sure. So, I mean, I think people always see me here as like the sunshiny person and like, everything's great. Everything's fine, you know? Um, and so there were things in the previous years that me and the physical education department chair had put in place just for that reason, because we have a similar personality um, and mindset in terms of taking care of our staff. Um, and also, you know, whether in, in a holistic approach, um, not just in the way of like focusing on academics or making sure that they're doing everything right that way, but recognizing that they need to take time for themselves as well. So we created um, like a teacher yoga program. We had uh, accountability partners for walks and runs. Um, and those were things we were doing prior to um, and so anytime you saw us together, I think people were like, oh my gosh, what are they concocting now? Um, and then we also had like a sunshine committee that I'd started with the history teacher to build rapport and um, build positivity within the staff. So as COVID hit, um, you know, we all had the different task force and everybody had a role, especially in administration. And so, you know, obviously the focus was on safety and health um, and that's, you know, important and logistics um, and planning ahead of time. But one thing I think it was very important for the head of school to um, focus on was also looking at wellness. Um, and so we created our own wellness task force and that started with me and the, the um, physical education department chair, as well as the middle school psych and the upper school psych um, and the DEI coordinator or DEI director um, and a few teachers who have been implementing mindfulness and um, social emotional learning into their classroom already. So we, we thought it was already important. And this was like definitely a time to be proactive and preventative um, for, for our staff and students. But in this case, you know, you can't fill, you can't pour from an empty cup. So we mm -hmm. all focused on the staff first because we knew that students were going to be discussed. We knew that we were all thinking about students um, throughout this whole practice, but we knew that the teachers were already also overwhelmed and a little spread thin from COVID and what we had to shift and do in the previous year. So over the summer, we came together and we created different ideas and things um, to to really focus on staff. So we started with um, a wellness baggie, <laughs> which was um, it included, which I was obsessed with at the time and still am, calm strips, um, so that it's a mindfulness technique and just helping them, helping teachers to come back into their own present moment. Um, it had a mug that said teachers can do virtually anything. Um, it had some tea and lozenges and things like that. But then we were like, okay, we've done this gift. Everybody knows about giving gifts, but we've, we've got to take it a step further. Um, so with that, we started doing Tuesday tips, which were emails that we sent out each week to discuss mindfulness, meditation, and also different um, apps and websites to just remind teachers like how great they're doing, what they need to do. Maybe it's even like stand up, you know, <laughs> drink water, <laughs> um, and just motivational ideas ideas and memes um, and you know also trying to take care of ourselves in the middle of this sometimes <laughs> things were just basic and other times it was like yes we're gonna have um, this vision board party or um, we had of course you know to connect we had virtual happy hours and things like that um, and you know it took on a uh, whole lead on its own. And we've been continuing the virtual yoga, continuing uh, accountability partners, and um, just a whole bunch of different activities just to make sure that people still feel connected. Because at this time, we can't see the different or staff members at each division like we used to. Right. And, um, and so we don't generally share product tips in yes. our <laughs> webinars, but I did throw the calm strips <laughs> in. Um, <laughs> So one of the things that you said when we were talking about this is how things evolved over time. And you've alluded to that as well. But 
just think about when school started in August or September, depending on what part of the country you're in, we had one mindset for sort of length of time that education would be disrupted. And that certainly changed. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, um, for us, you know, we went from the regular synchronous to asynchronous and, um, and we lost all connection with our students when we went online. And so we had to figure out different ways to still connect. Um, another idea, and I think I talked to you about this, Sarah, was you know our head of upper school was sending out emails every week um, with just talking about you know recognizing where we're at and um, providing different articles that I had sent him on mindfulness. But then it was also a time where like you know what teachers are doing great things outside to keep themselves busy besides what you usually see of them. Let's open that up and be transparent um, and show the art teacher creating bread. Um, show, you know, um, the science teacher, you know, working on running, you know, um, and doing a 5K, which they've never done. And focusing on the fact that education can be, a multi, you know, m many things um, and not just the one. And like, and it also became about like Mary Kondoing the curriculum <laughs> and simplifying things, um, which was really, really difficult, I think, for a lot of teachers and, and staff members to adjust to. Adjust to. Um, but we try to make it work as much as possible. And now, you know, we see that um, there's still that connection there that was there that previously we started last year. You know, something that we talk about at one schoolhouse that I'm going to ask Liz to address too is the power of video to build connection. And by that, I don't mean the, um, the Zoom class where the, you've got 20 little boxes, but how does making a video of oneself baking bread and saying, hey, you know, how does that help somebody else really get to know you? And Liz, can you talk just a little bit about that power? Sure. So um, I can give an example here that's um, pretty far out there. So you know, just like um, at a face-to-face -face school, our teachers create some of their own content and they curate others. Um, Leslie, as our abnormal psych teacher, can speak to that. And so um, we had um, a Latin teacher last year who took over a Latin two class and she kept a bunch of the videos that her predecessor had made because they were really good at explaining grammar. Um, and, um, and it her was the teacher was on screen. You could see her voice. You could hear, you could see her face. You could hear her voice talking through it. Um, the, our, our Latin teacher our, for the second year Latin class, um, unexpectedly passed away in January of last year, very with no, no warning, um, which, you know, anybody who's been in a school who knows this happens is that it's, it's painful. It's disruptive. It's, you know, heartbreaking, it is all those things. But what was so fascinating um, is so the teacher who had taught the course the year before said, let me step in. I want to do this for my friend who has passed away. I want to finish her class. And student after student, when she went to her first teacher meeting with them said, oh, I already know you. Because they had seen her voice, they had seen her face and they had heard her voice. Um, you know, one of the tricky things about Zoom is that um, with Zoom, part of the, what causes Zoom fatigue is that our brain sees faces and is constantly scanning for all the other information that it gets when we're face to face um, in a live interaction. Um, it's kind of like if you um, leave, you, you know, like when your cell phone is looking for Wi-Fi. Um, and you're on it and it just kind of runs the battery down. It's like, I don't see any, it's supposed to be here. Um, that's what happens to you on Zoom, but video is different. Video is different because it's structured. It has a beginning and an end. It has a purpose. Um, and so over the years, we've learned that not just do we have our teachers introduce their course and their week and most lessons with a short video where they're using their their voice and you hear and you see their face um, that we do the same with students that students create video to talk that you, instead of having a student respond in a paragraph we might have them respond in a 30 second video um, and so those ways in which we can get the info, get, we can, um, we can build connection, even when we're not together, are essential. Um, 
And it doesn't matter if you're online or in person, it's the connection to the teacher that drives the students learning. Thank you. I think, you know, Liz, um, I want to make that connection between what you just said and what Leslie was saying about admins sending out videos and teachers sending out videos. And Leslie, you kind of, in, I can infer this, but it seems like teachers then took ownership as well of this wellness committee and supporting one another. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I mean, Going back to what Liz was saying, I think that was like, especially this time last year, teachers were learning for the first time how to even use some of these different tools. Um, and so it was a great new beginning um, in some in a lot of ways for some teachers, especially for the ones who had been flipped classroom, had been in flipped classrooms or have been using these video videos. They now connected with teachers who were doing the old school ways of things and came together and connected. Um, so it was nice to see that. And I think the same thing happened with our wellness task force. Um, it became a time to like kind of streamline a lot of the activities that you could do in the classroom and, and talk about that. Um, as well as also recognizing like that this isn't just about the students, this is about you. Um, and here are some tools and tips um, for you during a time that, you know, there's Zoom fatigue, there's just emotional <laughs> distress. Um, and sometimes you're just exhausted in general. Here, we're just giving it to you. You do what you wish with it. Yeah, I think that's great. Okay, so it's mid-April. We are, we're looking, right? May and June are in sight, but they're not here yet. So what do teachers need from their leaders to get through this next phase of the academic year? How does this spring need to be different from spring 2020? Yeah, I mean, I think just like any other year, this is the time of year seniors are about to leave um, or go on projects or juniors are like getting ready and up and roaring for their next year. There's so many different things happening, but we're all a little bit more burnt out and exhausted um, because we've been working all year. Um, we didn't really have this stop in the summer. So I think it's, you know, for academic leaders, it's a, a time to just recognize that um, and, and, you know, see that there's, there's still a lot of things that we need to do and maybe just checking in with their staff members on like, what do you need right now? Um, whether it's just like, just dumping information and talking through things um, as if it was me, or is it, you know, helping them to problem solve through the last couple of months, like how to better support um, their team, how to better support their students, or just talking through things. Um, I think the connection still needs to be there. And we've forgotten about that in the midst of, you know, trying to get through every other adjustment um, that's been going on. And plus this year, you know, it's it started off still with us, you know, at least hybrid and, and you can't really see people the way you used to. Um, everything's online. Our Google meets just for regular meetings. We can't do those things like we used to. So the connection is not there and, um, and we need that. Um, and we need that to be consistent. And I think it's important, especially from academic leaders to, to reach out and whether that's just them walking by the classroom and saying, hey, like, how are things going? I've noticed that students have been saying to me during, you know, while meeting with me that you're doing great with adjusting your curriculum or you did really great with this one email that you sent to a parent that I know is difficult for you at a difficult time. Little things to show their many successes um, during a time that is stressful and really taxing is so important. We all have to find the little joys right now. I think that's so important. Um, and so being recognized it for it is great. I think there's also, um, I was talking to another colleague today and she was like, I just need the gift of time. Like, I love the goodie bags. I love recognition and emails saying you're doing great, but I just need a little bit of time. Um, so, you know, this year our head of school has provided two days that were like head of school holidays for just a day off to disconnect and disengage. 
we have Memorial Day coming up, um, but you know, if there are other things that we can do just to give staff breaks, um, I think that's important. And as the warm weather gets here, I think it's also about like gift of gathering, right? Um, making sure maybe to have things outside that are, you know, obviously within the guidelines and your state, um, but still recognizing that like we need that energy from one another and we don't always get it from the screen um, as much as we would love it or the phone, <laughs> you know, sometimes we really just want to see each other. Um, and that's important too. Yeah. You said a couple of things that I just want to draw out again. You talked about the value of really specifically recognizing what somebody's achieved or accomplished rather than saying, you know, at a girl, Sarah, the yeah, uh, times, but like you have handled this situation really well. And I know it was a challenge. Yeah. That's active that listening is so, you know, uh, I mean, just recognition, recognition and positive reinforcement works for students all the time, right? It's a, it's a motivation and they want to feel validated. Well, so does staff. Um, and so not just being there and saying it, but being authentic with it and being like, I maybe don't have the answers for you, but I am here for you. Um, what do you need right now? And wow, that sounds like a lot. Um, you know, just acknowledging um, and and actively being involved in their story is really important right now, I think. Yeah, I want to remind everybody that we've got the Q&A for questions, but I did have someone message me a question, um, which is, I, I think what you just said might help answer this, but I'm afraid to ask how people are doing and really getting an answer because I don't know what I'm necessarily going to be able to do about it. Yeah. Yeah, I think sometimes even just the honesty of that um, is important. I mean, I, there are plenty of times, and Lisa, Dr. Lisa DeMora says this all the time about parents and students or their children is like, sometimes they don't want you to answer, like to solve the problem. And they might be able to reflect in that time with you what they actually need, but knowing you're there and knowing that you are going to sit in the discomfort with them um, is so crucially important. It's the same way with like DEI work, I think too, you know, sometimes you're, you're not going to have all the answers, but knowing that you are willing to sit in the discomfort and sit there with them is, is truly um, powerful and energizing, I think, for some. Um, and it could help them to create a plan or you two to create a plan together. You just never know until you put yourself out there to do it, which I know is scary. And I totally um, recognize that academic leaders have a lot on their plate and probably need to be heard as well um, and, and patted on the back as well for everything that they've done. Um, but I think, you know, teachers have done an exceptional job this year and we've and we've lost touch with that, with all the other things that we're doing and, and losing that divisional meeting time and losing these different meeting times that it's important to just swing by and check in. You know what, that reminds me of just the fact that there is so much joy for an academic leader too in having a conversation with a teacher that is not a, we have to solve this problem right now type yeah. conversation. But you know, tell me about something that happened in your classroom where you feel like folks came together, even if it was virtually um, and just listening and appreciating those, those successes. Um, I just want to put in, wait, can I just put in one quick plug, which uh -huh. is that listening is doing something. Yeah. That's a good, um, great point. And so just giving the gift of time for somebody to tell you and to hear it, and then to integrate that into your relationship with them. That's a lot. Yeah. So I wouldn't, don't, don't sell yourself short, just being willing to ask the question and take it on. That's a pretty big gift. I'm so glad you brought that up. That's great. And Leslie, you had some resources to share and I just dropped those in the chat. So folks have the link. And we also had someone mention uh, an app that they liked that was called 10% Happier. So um, that came into the Q and A, but that would be a great one yeah. to share in the chat as well. And then Leslie, you had one other thing to say that I, we sort of wrote over you. Sorry about that. Oh, no, you're fine. I was just, the other thing I was just thinking about was like, um, you know, toxic positivity is a real thing and, you know, and we're all struggling right now. So like not saying the good vibes only, or like, you've got this, but more of like being there and listening, like Liz said, I think that that was just how, what I wanted to emphasize on the end of the thing. 
I was hoping that that was what, <laughs> what you're about to say, because the first time you introduced that phrase to me of toxic positivity, I had to do some sitting and reflecting in with myself. Does, is that like a phrase? Are there phrases that I go to that are not healthy for anybody to hear? Yeah, I've been reflecting on that myself with students when, you know, again, they just want to express themselves and be heard. They've heard every other problem and how to solve it um, from everybody else. I'm just the one that they want to talk to. And it, you know, um, it's humbling for me too, because sometimes I am like, but let's think about the positives. And they're like, but there is none right now. And you're like, right, correct. Right now, that might not be the case. So let's talk about where you're at. And can you find one? <laughs> sometimes I'm like, can you find one thing though <laughs> before we leave? <laughs> I won't push you too hard, but can we we come up with one? Um, You know what? I think that is the right way to close any conversation. Is there one thing that um, you can say, this is good and I'm going to keep this part. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's a, a challenge to everyone today. If you have an encounter where you're solving a problem or doing something difficult, as you wind that up, think about, okay, what's the one good thing I'm going to extract from this? Leslie, I can't thank you enough. We're going to have you back. (laughs) Yay. I love that. I would love that. I know your colleagues at school um, have, because some of them have reached out to me to tell me how wonderful you are. (laughs) So you have really had an impact on the adult experience at your school. And as you said, adults can't pour from an empty cup. So thank you. No problem. Thank you guys. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.